John, tonight, uh, just to start off first, will you tell us about your family, who your grandparents were on both sides, and their, yes. and their names and all that kind of right. stuff, so that yeah. people could kind of trace it all back then. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, my mother and father, my father was Mar Power. He was one of three boys born in Market Street. His father was actually killed off the Munster and Leinster Bank in Waterford. He was a, a plasterer. There was many, many, I mean, I never knew him. And um, he had two brothers, both of them in CIE. In those days, you just have to do an exam to get into CIE. And the three sons did the exam. And my father decided, no, it wasn't for him. And he went into the bookmaking business. <laughs> Complete opposite to what his mother would have liked. His mother was a real sort of, um, she called herself a seamstress. That would have been my grandmother. I said I didn't know my grandfather. My mother was from Waterford. She was one of three girls. And I never knew my grandfather. He was at sea all his life. Or I never knew her mother. They were gone before I arrived. But my grandfather was at sea so long when he retired. They lived in one Olive Street in Waterford. When he retired, he couldn't live in the house. He could not live in his home. So he had a little boat down on the quay and he used to go down there every night. That was a great story. Now, I said that was only a story from my mother. But uh, she was a brown from Olive Street. My father was a true and true native. You go back generations upon generations. Uh, I think we originated from Dunhill, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was somewhere like that. We were related to the Delapores. That sounds very posh, but it doesn't. <laughs> and then where did your mum and dad meet? I couldn't answer that now. I don't know. I, well, Granny, what well, Granny, we, we always refer to her as Granny. She used to come out to Tremor a lot. And she had relations out here. So I presume that's how they, how they met. Okay. And then when you came along, where were you born? Where were you? I was born in Fort Patrick Street. That was the home. I was the youngest of eight. Two of the children died in between. But I was the baby of the family. And what's your earliest memory then of the house or family? The earliest memory, and well, all, was, all the memories I have of Patrick Street, it was the happiest house. It was never closed. The door was never closed. When you walked in the hall, you were nearly in the kitchen. The stairs kind of came down nearly through the kitchen. There was four bedrooms, which was very posh because it was only a bungalow. And Daddy put on us another story on it because all Daddy's family were all carpenters, masons, the whole lot. They were all into that trade. Uh, they were great singers, wonderful singers and all my father's people and my mother's people. So there was always great sessions at home. Um, happy, happy memories of Patrick Street. And the fact that I was the baby, I wasn't expected. I think Mammy thought there was something else wrong with her and I arrived. So naturally I was a little bit spoiled and the rest of the family used to hate me <laughs> because I used to say, I'll tell Mammy on you. <laughs> But it was, it was wonderful. We had great times down there. And what was it like on the street? Do you remember what? Was oh, like? the street was brilliant. It was, And the funny thing about it, it can't be said today, when I was growing up, we had nothing. Literally, we had nothing. In actual fact, we might have been the better off of all the families, but we still had nothing. But we played with nothing. We made our own fun. And I said, come the winter, when the snow would come or the, the ice... We used to have the skate down the whole length of Patrick Street. And you'd hop off a wall at the very end of it. Now, you wouldn't do it today with the traffic. But always, honestly, all the families, everyone knew everybody. You were in and out of their houses. It was absolutely, and to this day, I'm still very good friends with most of the people that are still with us. So what, who were, what were the families on the street, did you remember? Well, there were the Partridges. There were the O'Connors. There were the Maloney's. There were the Keones ourselves, that would have been the only houses now with children in it. The rest, they were kind of oldish people. But the funny thing about Patrick Street, there was three number fours. <laughs> yeah. And there was, I don't know, many powers lived in the street. But they all had nicknames. Now, we were lucky because my father's name was Mar. And we were known as the Mar Powers. But you had Nicky the Baker, you had Nicky Ann. All these, everybody had a name. So it was, it was brilliant. We had great fun. 
there was a county council yard which is still there but it's not used a county council yard up at the top of the street and that's where we played just the girls the boys weren't allowed in and we used to play Queenie at the one of the girls was always the queen and we'd have a sweeping brush and make squares out of the little stones and that was our rooms and the innocence of it was you know I would love to I'd love to let my children my grandchildren see what we did because they'd only say you were all bonkers you know, it was, it was really excellent now. It's all make-believe. It's all make-believe, yeah. But we we were, like, my sister Kathleen, that's Geraldine's mother, she was nursing in England, and I remember she came home with a bag of shoes, high heels. So we used to bring the high heels up, and we'd be clattering around up in the lane. Again, make-believe. It was brilliant, honestly, it was absolutely brilliant. And where did the boys go? Oh, the boys used to win to actually breed a whittle now that you were talking to breed a rhine. They had a house that had a dungeon. And the boys always played down the dungeons. <laughs> and we weren't allowed in, naturally. <laughs> you know, so it was... And then we'd amalgamate, of course, you know, depending on what would be happening. But we were great, fa- all the families would sit on the curb of the footpath in the summer. That was, that was it, just sit around. No, we didn't go anywhere. There was nowhere to go. But we used to play, there was one particular game we used to play. It was known as Cut the Cabbage. Now, as you know, tomorrow's full of hills. But where the carry-out is at the top of Main Street, you'd stand there back to back and somebody would say, cut the cabbage, cut the cabbage, one, two, three. So you ran in different directions. One went down Patrick Street, one went down Main Street, and they did the circle. And whoever got back to the starting place first won. Well, your tongue would be down there coming up those hills. And then, of course, the, the old bicycle wheel was a stick. We clapped on this stick all around the place. What has beddies? We had to play beddies and all that sort of thing, you know. But the you mentioned there now the Corpus Christi procession. That used to come down Patrick Street. Actually, I was born the year that Corpus Christi was on towards the, ends of, the end of June. I was born that day because the story was that when the procession came down, I was born at four o'clock in the afternoon. When the procession passed down the street at about half past seven, Mammy held me up to the window. And all the lads used to say... It's a pity you didn't throw her out. <laughs> but imagine, imagine doing that today. Like, that wouldn't happen today. But it was very important that, you know, I was held up to the Blessed Sacrament. Anyway, I had no one to do me any good. <laughs> it was like you got a blessing from the... Yeah, this was, this was Mammy's idea of, you know, you know, I held you up to the Blessed Sacrament. But we would spend the whole day decorating all the ESB poles. They were wooden poles then. We'd have crepe paper wrapped around them. And then we'd stick these old weeds, they were pink flowers, real weeds is all they were. And we'd stick them all over the poles. We used to put out, my mother used to put her big banners like, Welcome Christ our King and Jesus is here and all this sort of thing. And we'd have bunting everywhere and it was brilliant. And to go up then to beside behind the Grand Hotel. And that's where they used to have the altar. So the fun would start then, like they'd be dancing and singing and the whole lot. So it was very, it was honestly, it was, they were brilliant years, we loved it. And there wouldn't be one pebble on the whole of Patrick Street. Everything would be swept. And of course, there was really no cars. But when the cars did arrive, they were told to keep going. Don't attempt to park. But they wouldn't do it today. Now, would the mothers sit out at the steps as well? Would the mothers be out? Or were they? Where were they? I'll tell you what, where the mothers were. We had a seat outside our house, right? There was a kind of a little front to our house and a railing around it. And the sun always shone at the other side of the street. So first thing every morning, whoever was up first in the summer brought the seat across. And the, the wall we were at was known as Spencer's Wall, because Mrs Spencer lived in the house there, where I, Wally Coffee lives now. But um, if anything at home now, my brother had a, a record or a gramophone, and he was very much into Mario Lanza, and he, this would be plain. And the famous saying was, well, I'll throw that over Spencer's Wall, everything, everything we possessed if we thought about it, was over Spencer's Wall. <laughs> you know, it was, it was brilliant, honestly. It was so you start brilliant. off on the far side? We'd start off on the far side. That's where we... And every person that would pass up would sit down on the seat to have a chat with Mammy. And then the, later on, would the chair be put back? No, uh, well, before you go to bed, it was brought over, because the sun just shone down Patrick Street all the time, all day. And it was excellent. But that was, you know, that was the chatting place then. And come here, can you remember any of the old people at that time? Like, you know, be like much older than your mum and dad? And uh, no, no, they they would all have been around the same era. Okay. Yeah. And, and great neighbours, great neighbours. And then, 
we, you all went to school then. Tell us about school. Well, school went to the, the start what, to the Sister of Charity. We all went there. And then the boys then, when they made the communion, went over to the, the boys' school. That was the big divide. But up to then, it was the boys' school, the girls' school. Uh, Holy Communion Day then was brilliant. You went back to the school for your breakfast. Now, I can't remember what we had, but we had something. But all that, of course, is lost, even though I've been at a, up in County uh, Meath at a communion two weeks ago. And the school that my granddaughter was in, all the parents and the grandparents go back to the school. And I thought it's the nicest thing I've ever seen. Because you don't meet outside the church. But once you went to this big hall and there was the children's tables in the middle and all the adults sitting around. So you met everybody and you had a great chat. And, but then when I, before I made my confirmation, I went into school in the Mercy in Waterford. I think Mammy thought I was going to be a brain surgeon or something, but she sent me in there. So I travelled in and out every day on the train. And just about the, the primary school here, first of all, <clears throat> what was that like? What was your memory of it? My well, memory of it was, that the one thing I used to love was the singing. Sister Pascal, it was Sister Pascal, I think was her name, one of them anyway, used to teach us singing, or Sister Ignatius. And she used to always say, Monica Devlin, God be merciful to her, and I were the best singers in the class. We were all, there was always singing in the school. You know, it was great now, it was lovely. I really, I hated leaving it because I lost all my friends. I went into Waterford and had to make new friends. And I used to get the train in the morning and I'd come home then, I'd have my dinner and I'd be on the six o'clock train going back into Waterford to Irish dancing. I used to go to Nancy Troy and Valley Truckle. So that, that was Monday, Wednesday and Friday. That's what I used to do. And why did you, mother, decide to put you in the nursery? I'll tell you actually the story. It is a funny story in one way. Um, uh, Mammy always had a short skirt on me, right? And my elder sister, Joan, God be merciful to Joan, and um, she was upstairs in the secondary school for like primary downstairs, secondary upstairs. And I used to go to confession once a month, the whole school had marched over. So anyway, I was in my class going over. So Sister Thomas was her name. I won't say anything. <laughs> and she decided to put me in the middle of the girls, including my sister, to hide me in the group so nobody would see my short skirt. So my mother went up and, you know, she was quite strong about it and wasn't happy. So she took me to school. I went into the Mercy. So I, made, I actually made my confirmation in the Mercy, from the Mercy school. Well, why the Mercy, not the Ursula? I don't know, actually. I don't know. I don't know. And, like, the, the train station was right, you know, in, in Railway Square. Mm. And the school was up in Yellow Road. It was a fair truck over, especially a fair day on Ballybricken. You know, going through all the cattle, it was dreadful. You'd be terrified of your life. <laughs> and then in the Mercy, what was that like? That's lovely. Yeah, Mercy was very nice. Yeah, very nice. I thoroughly enjoy that now. And what they used to do, you see, we were the country people. Do you believe it? From Tremor. <laughs> it's hard to believe that now, isn't it? Um, they used to make cocoa every day, the nuns, for the country children. <laughs> So I used to get a co cup of hot cocoa every day at lunchtime. <laughs> so I think there was five of us from work in and out on the train. But we were the country girls. Which is, you know... Tell us about the train then. What's your memories of the train? Actually, the train was great. We spent our time putting our heads out the window and getting soots in our eyes and all that sort of thing, you know. But what were the kind of rituals? What were the kind of things that... When you went down, did you have a ticket? How did it go? How did oh, you always get a monthly ticket. Yeah, a monthly ticket. And you just... Um, the funny thing, when you spoke about this to my family the other night, uh, when you turn... I lived in Patrick Street, so I had to go down Train Hill. And you'd, I'd be running every morning. And even when I went, started working in Waterford, I was the same. And I'd be at the last minute, and I'd turn the corner, and the door would be starting to close. <laughs> and I'd be waving. But in fairness, they always held the door for me. But you'd go flying down Train Hill. And they were good times. And then when I went to work, I used to wear high heels then. And I still ran down train hill in high heels. And there's a young woman who used to get off the train. She lived, I don't know where she lived, but she used to come out and she'd sit on one of the seats on train hill. And she used to say, Antoinette Power, you'll kill yourself. <laughs> I'd go down the road. But the man would be, and he, half the time he'd be, be, be blackguarding, you know, he'd see you. And he'd kind of close it gingerly. And when he'd go down, he said, you're late. Every single morning, you're late. Yeah. 
I think his name was Mr. O'Dwyer. He was a saucy man, but anyway, I hope nobody will hear this one. <laughs> And then when you're on the train, then would you, would it be a good crack on the train? Would you meet friends? Or would you would you'd meet, I've, the one person, I, I don't know, did you interview him? You didn't, Elvis, Tom Mills, no? He used to go into, to, I don't know where he well, was we going. going to see him on Friday night. Are you? Well, no, he used to be on the train every morning, singing Mario Lanza. I mean, he was fantastic. There'd be an absolute concert every morning and he was singing. And then he went to England and he came back as Elvis. And I thought, I remember you hitting the notes that Mario Lanza sang. He was great company, he was great. Now, there was a whole load of us just going out and there would be a bit of blackguard. And now, when I say blackguard, in my time growing up, there was never any trouble. You know, there was never rows, there was never guards called. You know what I mean? It was innocence. There was nothing, nothing. And in fairness to this town of Tremor, it's just one of the sweetest places in Ireland. Great place to be reared. And then, um, when, so you were in now to Tremor, um, or sorry, in, in now to Mercy. Yeah. And then, how long did you stay? Did you stay, did you do exams and all Oh, that? I did, yeah, 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 I did, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Now, would that be unusual that time? It would, would be unusual, a lot of people didn't, no, I didn't do my leaving, mm. because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. My father was a clerk for Richard Power Bookmakers. And every Sunday night, he used to have to do the books. He'd have these big ledgers in on the kitchen table, and I used to be fascinated. And I always said, that's what I want to do. And that's what I did. I spent my final year in the commercial part of the Mercy Convent. And then I went to work in Yellow Road, just up from the school. What was in Yellow Road? Yellow Road was where the betting office was. Powers had a betting office. And I started in there just before my 18th birthday. So same business as your father? Yeah. Yeah, and my sister was in y'all in the same business. And tell us about the, the bookie business, because, I mean, that was, I mean, I'd say it was very interesting, wasn't it? It was very interesting, but, like, if the truth be known years and years ago, that was kind of illegal. Like, in America now, when they'd hear that you're, you're working the bookmaking business, it was like making whiskey or something. You know, it was unheard of, like, that was, oh. But now, very interesting, very interesting. My father was a clerk, and they said he was the best clerk in Ireland. He was very fast on figures. He'd have a pencil in this big book, and every bet you called to the bookmaker, the bookmaker would call it to the clerk, and he'd have to write it in. And beside it, he would see how much was the bet and how much would it be taking out of the money. So he knew how much was being invested and how much it would be paid out. If it won. If it won. And then, at the, you know, at the end of each column, he could say exactly, he could say to the boss, uh, we're going strong on such a horse. So that mean cut the price. You know, don't be strong on this one. And then, of course, went all computerized. Oh, yeah, well, now it's amazing. Oh, it's but, unbelievable. But, but at that time, people had to do all this. Oh, yeah, oh, they yeah. They had to figure it all out yeah, in their head yeah, yeah. and make decisions. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but even to work in a bit in office, we had, we had no calculators, we had nothing. We had these big ledgers and you had to tot up and down and like that you had to be as quick as that. And it was very, very, that's what I worked at now, it was very interesting. And uh, would you have admin machines? No, 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 nothing, nothing. Everything was out of you. No, it would never, you wouldn't even write it down. You'd be able to look and say, you'd be able to add it up like it's, you'd get used to doing it that way. I couldn't do it today. And then obviously the other thing which was very... In those days, it was very normal. Was everybody smoked in these offices? They did. Oh, they did, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, I worked in a little office in Yellow Road. It wasn't as big as the corner of that room. Very tiny. Like, the, the counter was nearly at the front door. And the boys would be in there, and they'd be spitting, and they'd be smoking, and dreadful. a very bad environment to work in. But come Grand National Day, there would be five of us behind this little counter. And we used to put our left shoulder to the counter and write the bets like that. Because the counter was coming on top of us. Like, if you wanted to pass someone behind the counter, they had to get off the stool so you could pass. We had no toilet. We had to go into some land bakery to use the toilet. Like, when, when you think back on it, it wouldn't happen today. But it was, it was great. Now, there were some characters came into us. Brilliant characters. There were some pups as well, but we'd sort them out. Mm -hmm. And we were always called Miss... You never used your name. It was Miss Power and Miss Connolly and all that. And because I was Miss Power, 
they thought I was part of the firm. I wasn't. My father, we just happened to be poor and my father worked with them. But when I'd go in and they'd say, the boss, there'd always be a boss in each office, and she'd say, and Miss Power, what would you think of that decision? I'd say, I'll go ahead. <laughs> I was only a worker. I was the last in. Like, <laughs> I felt very important. You know? and, and did you ever then go to the, with your father when, he, when, when you were small? Did you ever go to the race meetings? Oh, yes, I went to them all. Yeah, oh. I went to them all, yeah. yeah. I did, because my husband actually joined the firm then, before I married him. He joined. So every holiday meeting, I was in the back of the car with my bag. But just when you were out with your father first, yeah. what was that like? I mean, was it, uh, did you find it? Ha What's your early memories of the races? Well, it would be the same as what I have the day I finished work, except different, how would I put different outlook, different bets, different... Now, it was a kind of a business that you'd really want to have your head screwed on you because the punters were very sharp, very sharp, and like that they do you. And they'd say, the price is that over there. Like, you know, if you want two to one, your man has three to one. Give me three to one. And if you're stupid enough, you give him three to one, but you're going to lose. Now, there's very few bookmakers who are stupid enough to do it, but the punter, some of them would be, keep at it. Keep saying, oh, come on, oh, come on now, you know. Give me oh, the better odds. Oh, would your father be standing up at He'd the be, board? Yeah, yeah. Well, he was a clerk, first of all. Okay, so and the boss died then, and daddy had to take over because the boss's son, who was David Power, he was he was in college, so there was no one to run the business. So my father ran Richard Power for maybe eight or ten years because there was no one else. So he kept the business going until David was old enough and was qualified. He he was an accountant, I think, until he was qualified. And then he took over. But it's a two-man operation. Like one man is up there on the board. Yes. And the other man is down below right now. Yes, but then you have a third man who is known as the runner. He used to run around and check the prices. Of everyone else. And everyone else. And he'd run back and say, the top is gone, the bottom is gone. Yeah. You know, that, that was the way. So there was three. There could have been four working. Now, when I worked in an office, there might have been six of us working in the office. But once the computers came in, two people could do it. But at, at the race meeting, you have to be very fast. Oh, yeah. If, oh, yeah. If, if the odds went somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to move fast. Oh, yeah. Oh, very fast. And you see, they lay off bets. That's one of the terms. They lay off money. Right. And say books. Yeah. What they say, this big bet came in and Paddy was the runner for powers. And they say, go to such a fella, have so much off. You know, the bookmakers would bet with each other. But there'd be some hustle to get there. Because you'd have to get there before some other bookmaker got in with the bet. And they'd be shouting, you're gone, you're gone. Oh, no, give it to me. No, you're gone, you're gone. And it was, everything was shouting. Yeah. Uh, everything was shouting. There was a fella, you might have heard of him, Terry Rogers. He was entertainment. He was always standing up shouting and saying, uh, come on now, lads, come on now, lads, you have the money in your pocket, come on, give it to me. And, you know, he was very, they'd have a crowd around him. He was brilliant. He was very good. But they were great times, I have to say now. And was there ever any, do you remember any of these, like, betting coups and all that kind of stuff? Right? Well, I would not heard of, I would have heard of them. Uh, I the, the biggest one, of course, would have been the Gay Future one. Yeah, that was a big one. That was huge. And the way they, they took it off was brilliant. It took some putting together. It wasn't even the horse that was... <laughs> the horse that was supposed to be was out in the field and was only the housekeeper blew the whistle on them. Very well put together. Oh, no, there was a few coups were tried time and time again. But was there ever any accusations? I mean, obviously, this is all in history, but of... of race fixing in Tremor? No, I wouldn't say Tremor. Now, Tremor was really a small meeting. You'd have to go to the bigger meetings as such because most of the big bookmakers mightn't be in Tremor. So you had to go for the big fellas. The small fellas were no good to you. You know, the shilling each way guys were no good to do a coup with. But their secret was how they were able to pull off a coup. In those days, there was no phones, right? So they couldn't contact somebody to say, so there was, there was, I was very fine, there was one, I think it was in Mullingar, the woman that worked in the office. If there was a big bet, right, she would have to get on her bike, cycle to the post office and send a telegram to Tremor. <laughs> Imagine that now. <laughs> yeah, I have, Daddy used to often talk about, I know her as Maggie or someone. He said, Maggie, if you're up on the bike and she'd be pedaling forever. <laughs> just, to, you know, just to go off and send a word to Tremor. And like telegrams then obviously were the big way of getting oh, yeah, yeah. information fast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was no phones. 
But then what they did when there would be phones on the race course, public phones, but they'd, they'd block them. There'd be somebody in using those phones, by the way. So you, the fellas couldn't get in to, say, to ring a head office and say there's something happening here. That's how, that's how the, the secret of it was. They'd block up the telephones. And then another one, what they used to do, they go around to the different bookmaker offices in the different towns and have the bet. And to be a case of, I would say, at ten past two, go. So you went into the nearest office, you had your bet. So by the time the word got that there's something happening, all the bets were done. And the race beyond. Yeah. And, and you see... The, the no, a bet is a, only a gentleman's agreement. Believe it or not, like legally. A bet was only a gentleman's agreement. And do you ever remember your father, like, sweating over particular races? No, never, 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 never. He was the coolest man. It was, it was so never. So therefore, he always worked out his percentage. He did, oh, he did, yeah. He did, he did, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was never, like... He was a very clever man. He was very clever, God bless him. And then what about the whole thing about uh, the horsey people and all that kind of stuff? Would you, would you have had much to do with all them? Like well, through no. well, through the, through the betting, you know, Daddy was just a bookmaker and that was it. We never had a phone at home because Daddy said, no, once I come home, that's it. Because if I have a phone, they're going to ring morning, noon and night about this, that and the other thing. And he refused to have a phone. But as regards now the horses, uh, Paddy's father had a riding school in Tremor down the beach. So horses were in Paddy's life. Paddy was a show jumper. He used to eat. He was up in RDS and all that. He was a good show jumper. This is your husband? My husband. Oh, OK. And then he be, he became a pint-to-pint -pint rider. He had two of his own horses, which used to be kept up in the race course with compliments of the Flemings so who had it at that time. And then how did you meet him? How did I meet him? Good question. <laughs> we all grew up together. He was in Main Street and I was in Patrick Street and... My sister was after getting married and the, the rugby dance was always in the Grand Hotel around Easter. So I went to the rugby dance as I was allowed, like the good girl I was. And I can still see the dress I wore. It was it was a red velvet because I was a bridesmaid for her. <laughs> so that's how I met him. Now, when I, that's when I met him. That's why I officially met him. But I knew him himself and his brother anyway. They were part of the gang. But he was big into horses. And then, of course, he worked for Powers then as well. And our eldest son is a vet with Colmore. He's down in Grange in County Fermoy. So you still have a link into the horses? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he has horses. Mm. But he's, he's into the reproduction end of things, so he's big time. And, I mean, you have all these millions of pounds worth of horses waiting to be to be put into foal. And he, that's his job. And it's a six-month thing. Like, I mean, we don't see him. We don't see him at all. He goes to work at six in the morning. He doesn't come home till half eleven at night because the mares are waiting to be covered. So horses are, it's there. And I have, the rest of my family wouldn't know. I have twins. If horses ran through the house, they wouldn't even know what they were. They'd have no interest in it. But I always had interest in racing because my father was in the business. And then I married Paddy, who was into horses as well. He saw the before him. And was the heart, was he, was he, I mean, I know they, we said the 15th of August was the big one. Ah, oh, stop, that was something else, because I actually had it, said I was going to talk about that. When my brother and I would have been the youngest at home, right, the rest of the family were, one of them was in Washford and one was in Yall, I think, because Kathleen was in England. But the biggest treat for Race Week and Tremor, now Race Week and Tremor was huge, huge. But our treat was the 15th of August to be brought down to the end of Train Hill to see the people getting on the last train going into Waterford. And I can tell you, in, in all my youth, I never saw a row. They'd be falling all over the place. They'd be singing and chanting and everything. Then there'd be a rush to try and fill the train because they, there'd be no room. They'd be hanging out the windows and everything. But that was the big treat for my brother and I to be brought down to the end of Train Hill and watch them all getting on the last train after being at the races on the 15th and then in the pubs. It was a great week, it was, what, yeah. What time that, would that be there? Half 11. Half 11 was the last train. Yeah, yeah. And God be merciful to Tom Cork when he used to work in the glass factory. Married, you, you actually interviewed Pauline uh, the other day in Sweetbriar. Yeah, her husband, he'd become now courtner 
And every night they used to have to pass our door in Patrick Street and we'd hear the run and we'd say, there's Tom going for the train every night down the road. <laughs> he never missed the train, but anyway, we'd know it was him passing down. And there was another story, there was a character, um, what was his name? Was Keown, was it Tom Keown? I think it was his sister or his aunt lived two doors down from us. But he was blind. And he'd leave the, her house every night and maybe it was 11 o'clock to go up at the top of the town. And Paddy and I'd be outside our front door. We were courting at the time. And we wouldn't say a word. And he'd say, Good night, Paddy. Good night, Antoinette. And I'd say, How would that? Oh, I mean it. Another time we moved up to Devlin's, near Devlin's door, and we said nothing. And Tom came up and he said, Good night, Paddy. Good night, Antoinette. But ever since, obviously he had a sense of some rock that he knew it was us. But we were always standing outside outside our front door. Amazing, amazing, cool, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was brilliant now, I have to say. When you think back, it was, you know, and I said, I only wish Paddy could tell you stories, he would have yeah. had some great stories. race week and all that, like, was there, I mean, obviously a lot of people came out and who probably didn't have a clue about which was a good horse and bad horse. Oh, I wouldn't have a clue. No, no, but it was the place to be and the thing to do. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, studying horses, they wouldn't have been. Oh, you'd get a few that would, but they were just general, having a good time. And in those days, there used to be the big bands used to come to Tremorford season, which would be July and August. There was one band, because two of the men used to stay in our house, Phil Murta and his band. They came to Tremor every year for the two months. And you might have, uh, what's his name? Ross, what was his first name? Something mm -hmm. Ross. He had another big band. But they used to come from more for the season. And again, like completely different times. They'd stay for the two months. They'd lived in the different houses. And like Patrick Street would have maybe, there was a woman next door to us, she used to take three of the men from the band and someone else would take two. But they'd all congregate, which was in our house. <laughs> our house wasn't big. But you'd have the whole band. You'd have a band of maybe 16 in the kitchen. Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. yeah. And there's a little fellow from Warsford. He was big into horses, Jack Evoy. He would have been Mrs Hill's right-hand man now. He was only that size. And he used to come out this morning. He had a little music, uh, musician's box. What do you call it? A squeeze box, he used to call it. And we had a little firm in the kitchen. And he was like a leprechaun. He'd be sitting there every night. And he'd play this every night. Brilliant entertainment. Ours was always an entertaining house. It was always singing. And, and Mrs Hill, was that the horse owner? Yes, yeah, Charmaine Hill, yeah. Dawn Run was the name of the horse. Yeah. Which is obviously a very famous horse. Oh, yeah, yeah, very famous. And I think Jack was the instigator of her buying that horse. Mm -hmm. He was a very good man to look at a horse and say, yeah, that's a good one, or it isn't. Or, you know, he was, he was a little nuisance when he got drinking, but apart from that, he was all right. <laughs> and, you know, in those days, you know, you wouldn't say fairy man to anybody now. And Daddy would say, Jack, will you go away, you little fairy man? And you know the way you think today? You couldn't use that expression today. It has a totally different meaning. And Jack used to always say, yes, boss, whatever you say, boss. Because <laughs> Daddy used to be dropping a few bob to Jack for the drink, like. But he was, a, he was a great character. But big into racing. But he was in Cheltenham one time, and he was real tiny, you know. But he was up at the bar, and he said... Hey, Jesus, girl, is anyone going to serve me? And the two of the barmaids, one said to the other, Hey, Josie, take a look. He said, a real live leprechaun. <laughs> and for Jack, when he thought I'd be on the counter. <laughs> yeah, great stories of him. I suppose a lot of the jockeys were small too. They were, yeah, they were, yeah. Well, of course, he was, he was a horseman too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But again, race week and Tremor, all the jockeys stayed in Tremor and the owners and, and those that had horses run and they used to keep them in Morrissey's over on Priest Road. They had a big farmyard and they had stables and the horses would be, some would be kept there because there wouldn't be enough room in the race course with the four days horses, you know. And who were the trainers around for war? Who were the trainers? Well, the, the nearest one would be now Henry de Bromhead. He'd be the nearest one. He's out in mm -hmm. Um Walter Halley, he was another one. And then, then after that, then you'd be going to the Kylies then in Dungarvan. They were famous riders and, and trainers. But in today's day, Henry de Bromhead is the top man. He's still going strong, isn't he? He is very good, yeah. He's excellent, yeah. He's excellent now. Nice fellow too. And his father before him, he had horses as well. 
And to go back then to your childhood, uh, <coughs> you were talking about he played in one place and the boys played in the cellar. Mm -hmm. You only got to the age where girls and boys were meeting each other. And yes, yeah, and yeah. Where was that happening? It was always, well, I put this, we never went anywhere. You go to the pictures, right? And the thing about the pictures, you couldn't afford to go into the, the back of that picture hall. There was a division and there was hard seats in the front. <laughs> the soft seats were behind. And... If you went to the cinema of a Saturday, we'll say they used to have a matinee, you'd never get a seat, but the fellow that was the porter, he used to line mats up in front of the, the screen and he'd be like that. She couldn't see a film, like, but we were, well, we'd be busting to sit there. But during the interval, there was, in, on both sides of the aisles, there, it was a kind of, um, it was like a shutter, you could lift it up and down if you wanted to pass through from one end to the other. Well, you'd hear this every so often. The boys be slipping underneath from the hard seats into the soft seats. <laughs> yes, they were great times. But the, the actual, we always went in gangs. Like, we were great people now for going to the rabbit burrs on picnics. We'd all go as a gang and we'd have, we'd have very little to eat, but we used to make our own lemonade. And I remember then my brother, he got a cine camera. So we were getting films. <laughs> We used to show the films at home in our sitting room. But we charged like you didn't get in for nothing. And I used to make the lemonade and I charged for the lemonade and they'd be going to kill me. They wouldn't give me money. I'd say, well, you can't have it. And one fellow would be saying, I have money, give me my one. And they'd be passing it all around. And another thing was a great one with a cigarette. When the cigarettes came out, you could buy them one at a time. And one cigarette would do 10 people. How we weren't all killed, I don't know. Now, there was another place where the boys and the girls used to play was in the paddock that was up on Pond Road. But there was houses in Patrick Street, especially up near the top, where you could get out over the wall to the paddock. We used to have a frying pan. We'd light a fire. Now, this would be all of us. You'd light a fire and you'd have a frying pan. And we'd be frying potatoes on that pan. How come we didn't all die? We don't know how much. There was cattle in the field and all. So we don't know what. We'd turn the pan upside down then for the next day. And now it's over the wall, like, and brilliant. The phone, the phone, honestly. And where would you go swimming? Oh, down the lady's slip was our place. We were always the lady's slip. I, I always maintained, I think I was born on the lady's slip, but anyway. And was your woman there then last stage? The woman, the, the bathing box? Oh, Mam Doll, yeah. Uh, I don't remember her, but I do remember the bathing boxes, but I don't remember Mam Doll now. She would have been before my time. There was bathing boxes on the ladies' slip and the men's slip. Now, the men's slip was originally men only. I mean, there was no, there was nothing that could stop you coming from the ladies' slip to the men's slip. But the men had the men's slip and the ladies' slip then were for the ladies. But that's where the gang of us used to swim. Now, some of us used to go to the pier. That would be a famous place to go swimming. If you were any good at swimming, you went over there. Especially in the summer. When the visitors be around and you'd be kind of hoping you'd click with a fellow over there or something like that, you know. We'd be showing off and all that. And my sister then, Geraldine's mother, she used to live, well, she lived very close. So I used to stay with her from the, for the summer. I would go from Patrick Street up to Love Lane on my holidays. And I used to swim at the pier all day. Yeah. Because she was married, was before... She was married, oh, she was, yeah, yeah. She's the eldest of the family, I'm the youngest. Oh, yeah. How yeah. was the age difference in your family? There was a... Uh, the eldest, Kathleen, now there was 13 years between Kathleen and I. Wow. So she was the eldest and I was the youngest. Right, so I mean, they obviously looked after you a lot. Oh, they did, oh, they did, yeah, yeah, yeah. They did. They did. And as I said, our house was open house. Everybody, everybody came to our house. De Valera was in our house. I don't think I remember him, but I, he was in our house, I don't know. I suppose because you're the youngest and you're hanging around with older ones, you kind of grew up faster. Sort of I did, but you see, Kathleen was away now. She went off to England. My other sister, Helen, who would be next to, to Kathleen, she went to work in Yall. So there was that gap. She was 11 years older. But my brother and I, he's two, what is he? Uh, three years older than I am. We were the two at home. Oh. So it was really him and I used to, and then he used to play with all the boys. But when they'd be going up to the dungeon, they'd say, they'd call me Nettie, they'd say, Nettie, come on, you can come up today. I'd go up and they'd frighten the Jesus out of me they'd put sheets over them, they'd go, ooh, and it was scary. And I'd say, I'm going down to tell Mammy. <laughs> I'd be running after me down the street. <laughs>
And and what other older people would you remember from way back? I mean, was there any characters around Tremor that you remember? Well, of course, Limerick Bill. He was a famous character. He was always knitting. And on Patrick's Day or uh, Pam Sunday, he used to wear a soft hat. Well, he'd have half a field of shamrock. And he always had things hanging off him, badges and always wore a trench coat. But he, he was a very interesting man, actually. And what was he knitting? I was in what? What was he knitting? Did you say? Yeah, knitting. He used to knit the whole time. I know what you say. He was always knitting, always. But he was a very good Irish speaker. There was another fellow now that I really don't remember. I don't remember any stories of him. But he was known as Pat the Darling. I know there was a poem written about him. I'm sure I have it at home somewhere. But I, I don't know who he was. Again, he was just that bit. I, I probably was too young. But Limerick Bill, we all knew Limerick Bill. And then, do you remember any of the, the people that used to do kind of palm reading and all that? No, 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 no. Okay. No, I never remember anything like that, no. And what about down around? Did you go down? Or oh, yes, down around, you're a famous spot. Like, you were allowed down around, but you were on a time schedule. When you were left down around, if you weren't at the front door at the time you were supposed to be, by God, you wouldn't be left out for a month. But again, we'd go down to the jukebox, was a fra famous thing in the arcades. We'd all be standing around the jukebox. There was one. There was one character in Tremor. He was a devil. Uh, he was a, he was illiterate, but he always had a newspaper under his arm, always. And people would say, um, "What's the What's the news today, Larry?" Same as yesterday, just bad. But he couldn't read. But there was another guy, Fairy O'Brien. No, know they would have heard of him or not. He was a wicked blackguard. But your man was there one day down around when you mention it, and he had the paper open. By the way, he was reading it, and everybody knew he couldn't read. So Fairy went over and he got a match and he set the paper on fire. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be in the town for a month after. And the language out of this fella, Fairy lightened the paper. But he couldn't read, but he always had a newspaper under his arm. And if you say, oh, what's the news today? Same as yesterday, all bad. And would your parents be kind of, you know, I mean, when you say you can go down the road, but you have to be back by whatever. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but would they... Would they disapprove of you hanging out down there? Uh, not really, no. No, they wouldn't. As I said, you would be allowed down because, you you know, you would have been trusted then. You know, you had the trust of... They had the trust that we weren't going to do anything out of the way. And I said, if you were told to be home at six, you were at the door at six, not at five past. Now, I mentioned playing in the lane. Every so often, I used to come out of the lane, and if I saw my father standing at our front at the pier, I would run down Patrick Street. And all he'd say is, I wouldn't say just to that. You weren't left out the next night. And it might be two minutes. But they were strict, but fair. Strict, but fair now. Okay. But I said they, they wouldn't mind you going down around because there was no, there was no harm. And we're always in gangs. That was always the safe thing. You know, if you were a gang, you were grand. But go on your own, definitely not. But you're the families that were associated with down around the families that came in with the hurdy-gurdies and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Were they accepted as part of the community? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. The originals of Down and Around would have been the Pipers. There's some of them still working another generation. And Edens were another crowd. They they probably would have been the start of it. But they were, they were accepted and they were treated as, you know, the people. There wasn't that many came into the town. Most of them were locals, you know, as I said, the, the Pipers now in particular, they go back generations. They would have been the originals now. Actually, the fields were at the back of what used to be the Atlantic. That was known as Pipers Field. All their caravans were in there. They lived there all year round. And so there wasn't that much kind of transient kind of stuff? No, 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 no. What about the circus? Gosh, the circus, when the circus came to town, sure. You wouldn't have the money to go to the circus, but you'd be able to see the animals. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but that would be great excitement at the circus, yeah. And where would they set up? They would set up now around Piper's Field, down uh, where the amusements are now. You know that field there? What was the name of that field now? Well, they were set up there. Okay. And there'd be no trouble. Never, never, never. You and know, you... that was that was the thing about Tremor. It was the time with the, when the teddy boy started to come around. We had a guard. Oh, no, give me his name. Oh, and Jesus, what was his name? But he handled the, the teddy boys. 
And everyone knew he's the fellow for him. He put, he'd run him. Like they used to come out from Waterford now. And the Teddy boys, and they'd be kind of throwing their weight around. But they never got away with it. This fella would say, get on that train now and don't come back. And they wouldn't. They wouldn't. But I said, during that era, that was another great era. Like, that was the jiving and all this sort of thing, you know. And then when you got old enough, did you start going to the dances? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love dancing. I love dancing. Now, having said it, I was, I was going out of Paddy when I was 15. And I'm still with them. And, and what, what, which, did you go to the Atlantic? The Atlantic, and the Silver Slipper was okay. the other one, yeah. And what, what, what stood out in your head? What bands were, what was Well, you'd have Joe last year, you'd have all those big ones coming to Tremor. The Clipper Carlton, all the ones now that we'd know of. The Brendan Byer, that, the, the, what was their, their, what was the name the of them? The Royal Show Band. When they'd come, all the bands came and they were, you know, they were packed. But the dancing would be great and there was no drink. The Atlantic had the ballroom and a place offered and the place offered was where you bought Kiora Orange. And if a fella bought you Kiora Orange, you were laughing. So we're grand now. <laughs> imagine, imagine the day if they bought you Kiora Orange, what you'd say to them. <laughs> but do, are you saying there wasn't much of an emphasis on drink then? Oh no, there was no drink. There was none. There was none. You couldn't get a drink in the dance hall. In my time, when I started dancing, you couldn't. But obviously you could go to the pubs before it. If, yeah, if you, but you wouldn't be allowed in drunk, I can tell you. They were very strict. But there used to be two sessions in the Atlantic for Sunday night. There'd be one finish at 12 and one finish at 3. And as I was getting just that bit older, I was allowed to go to the two sessions. So you'd have the holiday makers at the first session, you'd have the locals at the second session. <laughs> That's the... Quite late to get home, weren't it? Yeah, Maybe yeah. Imagine those days now, three o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Half three by the time you're in bed. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like but again, there was no trouble. None. And there was always somebody, some of the gang there to you'd come home with. You never came home on your own now, never. There was always somebody was going your way or... And they'd make sure that there was we were all going the one way. And then on New Year's Eve then was another great night in Tremor. You'd be banging and ban banging pots at 12 o'clock. My mother was great into that. Oh, she was always ready for this. And there was a, a band then used to come around. What did you be banging the pots in? What would you do? I'd be, at the minute the 12 bells ring, you'd be out making noise and we had railings and you'd have a, a fire shovel, you'd run up and down the railing with the fire shovel and blowing whistles and, and banging pots. the same thing? Everybody, yeah. Well, mostly number four, Patrick Street, I can assure you. <laughs> but everybody would come out. And it was great, we wished a happy new year, and then the band had arrived down Pond Road. So you'd follow the band, and that went up to the Grand Hotel behind it. And there was always a dinner dance in the Grand Hotel. And they had a kind of a balcony, we went up the steps, and went along by the dining room, and down the other side of the steps. So we'd all march along, we'd all be like this, looking in at the people eating, and they were all dressed up in bow ties. And... But then there'd be a dance then on the street beside the Grand Hotel. And what, what, what was the band? Which band? The band that would play for us would be a fellow on an accordion. <laughs> he was the leader of the band. I think actually Giles, wasn't he? John Giles, I think it was. And we'd all be following him to honestly, it was an adults, apart from the children. Adults. And then we'd have a great dance up in the, the square then. Again, very little drink. You know, so that was our entertainment. <clears throat> it sounds like a good crack. Ah, it was very good, it was very good, yeah. They were great times. And just in relation to uh, people in Tremor, the only way some people would be fairly poor and some people would be fairly... Like, uh, you know, the houses up in, up by the 24? Yeah, they, they, they were the poor houses originally. That's what they were called. But would, be, would people be conscious of the fact that they didn't have money and they did have money and all that kind of stuff? What was that? Well, everybody knew who had money or who had money. There really nobody had money as such. Now, we might have been just a, a little step above some people, right? But my mother was a very charitable woman. She was always giving to people, always. And if people were short, they often came to my mother and they'd give her the children's allowance book and she'd give them a couple of bob and they'd come back after the week and they'd collect the, the, the book again. You know, they, they were, that's, that's what went on. Like anyone that had a little bit more than anyone, they were there to be, to, you know, to call on. There was nothing charged or anything, but it was just a, a dig out. But Mammy was always very charitable. Apart from that end of it, she was always 
know if she had anything at all. Do you remember you were talking about the, the people in the Grand Hotel at the nice dance? Oh, yeah, Hotel. yeah. Who were they? They would, 90% 90 of them now would have come out from Waterford and it might have been, a, it wouldn't have been a rugby dance, but it would have been one of the higher, you know, we'd say, what would it have been? 20, oh, yeah. 20, Chamber of Commerce. Some of so they wouldn't have been Chamber of Commerce in those days now, but they would have been, you know. Business yeah, maybe a corporation or someone that would be having their dance on New Year's Eve. Okay. And all those gawking in at them and they eating and they all drinking the champagne were saying, what are they drinking? <laughs> Should we know what it was? Are they being kind of monkey suits? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The ladies have been dogged up to me. was a kind of a grand hotel. Oh, so. yes, oh, yeah, it was, yeah. It was the place to be. It was the place to be. Oh, if would you, she ever go in there for any reason or not? Not really, no, no, not really. Unless now that when the dinner dance has started, we say the soccer club, the GEA, place like that would hold a dinner dance in the grand. You'd be at that, all right. But the, the rugby dance used to be held every Easter Sunday night. And the ballroom was upstairs. And that's where I officially met my husband. When I was 15. And I know when I came home, my mother was sitting up in the bed and I said, Antoinette, I went in, who'd you come home with? I said, Paddy Crane. And do you know the question, the bit of heaven to her, do you know the quest two questions she asked me? Does he drink? I said, no. Does he smoke? No. All right, so. And she loved him. She just loved him. And like there was my three sisters had husbands, and at Christmas Paddy Crane got a Christmas present, but none of the sons in got Christmas presents. And they used to be going mad. Why did he get a present? He's not even in the family yet. Yeah, she was very fond of Paddy. But the first question, does he drink? Well, I suppose there was a lot of worries about drinking. Wasn't ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, my father was a good man to drink now, but he was not. He wasn't an alcoholic, but he was a good man to drink Powers whiskey. And he'd, he'd swallow a glass and just one swallow. <laughs> just gone. Yeah. So the powers of Trevor were fond of the powers of whiskey. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, he was, powers, was it gold label? Is that what they called it? I think it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> and then when you did start to go into pubs and all that, can you have any memories of pubs that in those days? No, we didn't go into pubs. Okay. Funny thing. Now, in my time, you did not go into a pub. You went into a hotel. But you did not go, that's in, and you no, know, when we were in our courting days, no, you didn't go to a pub at all. Okay. That was off limits. And I said, if you were at a dinner dance, like where you'd have bars there, but there was no, was there, on, on any of the gang didn't drink, none of us. I mean, I was a pioneer myself to about five years ago. And I'm 75 next month, so I kind of waited a long time. <laughs> and now I take a glass of wine and I'm any ones, and they're right here on. <laughs> 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 and what about uh, the what shops do you remember from your childhood childhood my, well, the one shop well of course with the l &N, which was the London and Newcastle Tea Company that was the main shop in Tremor there was um, the drapery shop Flavins that was at the end of Earl Street and there was another one then um, Tom Martin he had a drapery and news agent that was, and there was Flarty's. There was a Flarty shop in Market Street was a very settled shop, which would be, be for the, the gentry. They always had, the old people used to go in there and, you know, if you said, oh, I got that from Flarty's, they'd say, oh, did you? You know, that kind of, yeah. And there was two old sisters, they were spinsters, they ran that. And where did you get comics in these rounds? And again, now you get them in Martin's was the, the, the news agent. But Daddy, God be merciful to Daddy, he was always a great man for bringing home comics to us. Because he'd be in Dublin a lot and, you know, at the races and then when there'd be a newsstand, he'd always come home with comics. Always. And every week he used to bring a box of fruit home from the fruit sellers at the races. Yeah. So you were obviously a popular girl then? Well, all the, that's what all the yeah, family all used to get. The, you know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, we would have had just... No, I'm not saying that we were above anyone else. We were not. We were all equal. But like Daddy had a good job. And there was very... There was very... There was no money then. No money. And I said, my mother, my grandmother was a widow woman and she had to work hard to rear three sons. You know, and she and I said, it was amazing that the three of them did this exam for CIE and the three of them got it. They're very clever lads, the three of them. There was one then, Liam Dupuyer, he was um, an archaeologist. He was my first cousin. He was my uncle's son. They were all very clever. I don't know where I went wrong, but anyway. I'm blaming all my elder 
people that Kathleen and Helen and George they used to kill me. And and you you were born just after the war. Yes, I'm forty three. Yeah. Mm. So. Do you remember any of the kind of talk about the war? And I would have heard Mammy talking about the war and Mammy and Daddy would have been talking about the rations and all this sort of thing. But I, I don't, I certainly don't remember them. Okay. And oh, like the time of the Black and Tan, and I would have heard all that story. Yeah. You know, because their Mammy and Daddy would be talking and telling the stories about that, but I would have known personally, I would have known nothing myself. And was your house, was it very much a Fianna Fáil house then? Very much, very, very, very much. Which, which is why you said Dev... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And Annie, as I was saying, I was saying to you this morning, Kieran, uh, any elections that went on, our house was the base for the Fianna Fáil party. And whatever food was given, my mother gave it. No charge, she made dinners, teas, sandwiches, you name it. And they'd all be coming in and out the door because the, the hall, the assembly rooms, as it was known as, that would have been the base for the elections and all that. They weren't like now. That was the only place you could make a vote was in the in the assembly rooms. They weren't like around the schools like they are now. So it would be great. That was great times. All these different people coming in, and you know, and she knew them all, and but very much Fianna Fáil. That's why I'm inclined to go Fianna Fáil only because it was bred into me, and I know nothing about politics. Waterford wasn't a particularly Fianna Fáil place. Was it? I don't it think so now. I think it was more Fianna Gael. Yeah, yeah. But no, Fianna Fáil was very popular in Tremor anyway. No, in my house it was. Yeah, yeah. I think they used to get one TD in for the county. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> right, so you used to get two Fianna Gael. Yes, that's right, yeah. Like, Fianna Gael was kind of, um, how would I put it, it was kind of maybe, like, as we spoke about it, Kieran, uh, Protestant orientated. Yeah, well, the parliamentary I think, party. Yes, Ireland, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Looking towards Britain. Yes, know. yeah, yeah. I do remember Mammy used to talk about that now, but again, it meant nothing to me at the time. Yeah. But no, true and true, Fianna Fáil. And, uh, <coughs> well, instead, what about the, uh, did you remember the, uh, what, what year was the explosion in the garage? What year oh, was God, that? I don't know what year that was. Was that before your time? No, no, I think it was, I might have been, I may have been born now, I were close enough to have been born. So it would have been around 43 or... I'm not sure now what year that was. Okay. But I know my mother was first on the scene. Go mm. Because she was a nurse. She, well, she, was, she, she was in the Red Cross. Yeah. But she got a bravery medal and all for that. Yeah, she was first on the scene. Of course, we were only four doors up from her. Now, I don't remember. Now, maybe I wasn't born. Maybe I wasn't in it at all now. But no, she was the first on the scene anyway, and there were bits and pieces all over the place. Mm -hmm. And everything was brought over to the assembly rooms, this famous, it was the only place we had in the town. What was the assembly rooms? What was your memory of it? Was that, was that where the library was as well? No there was, never, no, there was never a library there. No, the assembly room was a kind of, um, how would I put it, a community hall, if you like. The okay. plays went on there, the, everything went on there. It was the only, I said, the only hall that was here. And what, who did plays there? Well, the local, the local uh, drama, or the local society, like there was not, there wasn't a society as such, but a group would get together and put on a concert and, you know, and they were great times too. Mm. And the, the best place to be was at the back of the hall. <laughs> and you said you used to do the Irish dancing? Yes, yeah, yeah. Did you do that kind of in, in competitions? Or? Yes, yeah, I was a uh, monster champion under 12 for three years running. I used to have to go to Cork down to the Father Matthew Hall with Nancy, Nancy Troy was the teacher. But I'll tell you now, in those days, we enjoyed it. We were young, we didn't know what was happening. But the mothers would travel on the bus with you. Jesus, they were like fish women. And dare you go into a competition that you weren't entitled to enter because some other would come along and say, she's overage. Well, there's been murder. And you'd be on the bus and the bus would be full to capacity. And there'd be firms from the back of the bus to the front, and you'd be sitting on those as well. And you go to halls, and they wouldn't be fit to put a cow into. And you dance in a fish, and you might have to dance around a hole in the stage. You know that's that's true. And any concert, like the any concert, now few of us would always be asked to dance in it. 
You see, because there wasn't dancing so, as such, I used to dancing in Tremor, which was in Waterford. And I said I used to go in three nights a week in on the train into a little house in Bally Truckle in Waterford. But like, because there was a few of us did that, any concert, I'll get the girls to dance. But you could be on a fucking barrel. You'd have to dance on it. But they were good times too. They oh, were was your mother a supporter of that? Did she like all that? Oh yeah, she was. She was very much into it. Yeah, she was. She was loved the Irish dancing now herself. Even though she would have been more a ballroom dancer or something, daddy. And did you? I mean, did you sing in competitions? I did. did. Yeah. Uh, what kind of like fishes and stuff? Like fishes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how did you go on? I thought I was great. <laughs> no, I was with the, the um, score. I was big into that now, the adult score through the G8 club. I was being competition. Like, we got to a few county finals, but we weren't successful. I used to go, I used to be in the ballad group. You'd have to sing two ballads, and they'd be a group of six. And would it be too much to ask you to sing a song? Kieran, you didn't tell me that one now. Kieran. No, it would be nice, just some point of view, of just to have it like a little record of you singing a song. And we won't be expecting anything at all. We expect we'd be expecting it to be terrible. So, at an over terrible would be. Can, I, can, I would be over terrible. Now I have to say I would on, be. But well, what could I sing? Just uh, any old ballad that you remember. Oh Jesus! Throw something at me. Um, what did I say now? Well, even something that you remember, you associate with your dad or your mum or. Oh, I do. I do. My grandfather's clock. Oh, my grandfather's clock was too tall for the shelf, so it stood 90 years on the floor. It was taller by half than the old man himself, though it weighed not a penny, weight more. It was bought on the morn of the day that he was born. It was always his pleasure and pride, but it stopped short, never to go again when the old man died. There's your lot now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I a little bit above terrible. You were much above. Much above. Anthony, thanks very much. Not at all. It was That's certainly great. my pleasure. That's great. And you've got a really good memory of all those little details. Yeah, yeah, sure. If you thought about it, there's so much more. Like, it's, it's very hard to... You know, and then I'm sure you're on the road you'd be saying, oh, I should have said that. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. As I said, I... Tell us about Christmas in your house. Oh, yes. It does. This, now, this you won't believe. What? What? Christmas night, in our in our time growing up, you never left your home on Christmas Day or Christmas night. You never went visiting, nothing. You stayed at home in your own home. But in our house, I don't know how it started, but all my family played shop on Christmas night. We'd set up the kitchen table and my eldest sister, Geraldine's mother, always had to be the shopkeeper. We'd be gathering boxes and bags and tins for weeks. And they'd all be set up. My mother and father would be in the sitting room, sitting at the fire, and all the adult children, the six of us, played shop. We dressed up in all sorts of things. You could have been a nun, you could have been a ballet dancer, you could have been anything. And there's one memory I have of my brother. He had a fur hat on him. He had a thing off a coat, like a fur thing around his neck. And there was used to be uh, net curtains that were only that size. You used to put them across the top of the window. He had that around and an alarm clock hanging off him. We'd have every sort of a thing on us. But we played shop every Christmas night. And my sister, you used to, there was a famous name of a blouse, Coon Ella. And Flavin used to, used to sell it. And you'd go in and you'd say, eh, would you have a Coon Ella blouse? Yes, of course. What size would you like? What colour? And you say, have you got it in blue? And she'd put her finger, now this is no word of a lie, down the wall beside the fire. There was nothing there, but she'd be, by the way, checking to see how she's the size in it. They were, they were great times. Now imagine six grown people. And nobody else would be involved, like just the six children. And Daddy and Mammy would come in every so often and he'd just to say, is the shop doing well tonight, Kathleen? It was, I mean, the stuff we were selling, sure we were selling it and putting it back again. They were, that was Christmas night in our house. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. That's lovely memory. Nobody else did that, I can tell you. You'll never hear a story like that. Can you remember any superstitions? Oh, yeah, there was huge. Oh, she, yeah, Mammy was very super, super, superstitious. <coughs> tell us something. Well, she wouldn't walk under a ladder. She'd walk around the town, but she wouldn't walk under a ladder. 
a black cat. She always believed in black cats. Another thing she believed in, signs before death. Now, they used to be frightening. Mammy was a great one to tell you a story. She used to read the old boys to us, Kiss of the Hair and you know the ghost stories and everything. But she'd always believe if she heard a noise, she'd say, oh, such a person is after dying. And we'd be all saying, but she used to be right. Now, it was only coincidence, but she was always right. I remember uh, Mrs. Power from Market Street. She she was expected to die, of course. And we're in the sitting room and there was a tap on the window. Now, it could have been a bit of a leaf that hit the window. Oh, Mamie is dead, she said. A half an hour after, her husband arrived at the door to say she died. At the time, Mammy heard the... No, that was frightening. She was into all those sort of things now. Mm. Hansel Monday, she was big into Hansel Monday. She'd always give you a Hansel, but she'd pay nobody of Hansel Monday. Be... How did that work? Tell us how it worked. Just, it's just a thing. It was bad luck if you paid... If you had a bill, you don't pay it on Hansel Monday. You certainly don't, but you'd give a Hansel to somebody, just a coin. And they'd spit on it and they'd put it somewhere. She always used to have bags of them at home. Because we wouldn't spend them. You couldn't spend them. You see, that was the luck money, which was all. But anyway, we believed in those things. And what, day, what time of the year was? The first, on, the first Monday of the new year right. was Hansel Monday. And was there anything too about going in the back door or out there? I'll tell you what that is. That's the new year. Yeah. I do it. I do it. I still do it. At 12 o'clock, you open the front door, you open the back door. And you welcome the new year in and you tell the other one to make off out. Every single, all my life, that has been. And I still do it. And was another one too with coal? I can't remember, was something about coal? No, there's, I think, now my brother, I don't know, is it from, from his wife's side of the family, uh, to throw a loaf of bread in the front door on the first day of the year. And I'm thinking, now why would you do that? Like, I, I never, I never, I never heard of it, but he, he that was his one. But definitely the front door and the back door, and to this day, and even my children and my grandchildren are saying, Granny, open the doors. So, you know, it's gone on to that, and they do it. And what about the, is it uh, uh, hanging the piece of cloth out in the, out in the bush? Oh, I do the same place in St. Bridget. Yeah. yeah, I do that, yeah, I do that. But unfortunately, they're sharing the bit of rag now, because I haven't the original one anymore. <laughs> but I push out for St. Bridget, I leave it out for St. place. <laughs> They can fight over it. <laughs> yeah, I, I do that. I actually do that. It's funny, because a lot of those things are going, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 There's very few people who would even know about doing things like that. Do you know that? You know, that, that was, that's history. That's long, long ago. But I certainly, those ones I still do. And would your mother have believed in the fairies and all that? Uh, she never spoke of that. Now, she never spoke of believing in fairies. She did believe in the Banshee now. And the Banshee would prophesy bad things? Or... Yeah, yeah, well, you know, they call it the Banshee, but we never, she never elaborated on that now as much as other things, like the banging on the wind of someone dying or mm. the crow went that way or whatever. She was definitely big into all that. But fairies, no, but definitely the Banshee. And what was crows? What was about crows? Or something if a crow was down low or something, it was to do with, say, the power family. The some of the powers going to die. It was something now, I know that it was a bird, and I don't know it was a crow, but whatever he did, I don't know, but that was a sign anyway, mm. that there's some powers that was going to happen to him. And as I used to think in the latter years, when I was thinking, thinking back on I was saying, there's so many powers that was going to happen to everyone of them anyway, you know, <laughs> there was hundreds of powers around. You know, if you said power, which power are you? And then you say the, the nickname then, and they'd know who you were then. There was one, there was two men out on the, the list road, throughout the country there, literally across the road from another and two farms. And one was Tom and one was Thomas. So Tom was known as Tom the Chrysler. Obviously, his father was a bit of a Chrysler. <laughs> and then the other man was known as Tom the Widow. And there was no widow, but he was Tom the Widow. I used to be fascinated with those two boys. Guys, how many powers are here? There's thousands of powers. I mean, if you went into the history, I'd say we're all related. <coughs> you know, they're a fair gang now. They're a good gang, though. I'm proud to be one of them. <laughs> so that's now. 
Okay, Angela, thanks very much. Not at all. Thank you. I mean, imagine after singing and all. Don't tell Geraldine. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you. I will love you.